Hi, everyone. Uh, so it's, it's a little early to start, uh, but I figured I could start by asking people what you're hoping to get uh, out of this class. So um, I'm Valerie Aurora, as you can probably guess. There's a mic over there. If you could use it so the people on remote can hear you. Uh, anyone want to talk about what they're hoping to, to get out of this class? Like, I don't know, maybe not having another boring meeting. Or, <laughs> or if anyone up front, I can just hand you my mic. I'll tell you briefly part of my motivation for, go ahead and head up to the mic, but I'll just tell, uh, tell you briefly part of my motivation for learning how to give good, have good meetings is I hate being bored <laughs> and I hate wasting time. And that's unfortunately two things that happen a lot in meetings, so. Yes. Hi, I'm Katie Love and I am interested in learning how I can support uh, meeting spaces to have more diverse and inclusive spaces for everyone to participate. It's an interesting thing. Uh, interesting meetings that are effective uh, usually mean that more people get to speak and um, there are fewer dynamics going on where people are unfairly getting, uh, getting their voices silenced. So they go together. It's great. All right. It looks like we have a ton of people here, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, as you probably guessed, I'm Valerie Aurora. This is my new company, Frameshift Consulting. That is my empty website. Please don't go to it. Uh, <laughs> this, this, this class is about meeting skills for inclusive moderators, uh, how to run a good meeting while helping everyone get their voices heard and making good decisions. Um, so why are we doing this now in a hurry when I just wrote this presentation in two days? Uh, <laughs> uh, so part of the upcoming All Hands in January uh, will be an unconference. And uh, I've had a lot of experience with unconference sessions and I found the good ones always have really good moderators and generally good meeting skills uh, in the sessions. So um, part of the reason we're doing this class now is to help you get the most out of this on conference that's coming up. Uh, so a little bit about why I'm doing this. Um, so I'm assisting organize the, organizing the uh, unconference part of the All Hands, because I've done a lot of it before, as the co-founder and the former executive director of the ADA Initiative, which as most of you probably know, supports women in open technology and culture including Wikimedia projects. So I also co-organized uh, co seven unconferences over three continents. Uh, we have a very detailed checklist that came out of that. Uh, that was Ada Camp. And I also created and taught the Ally Skills Workshop, which has meeting skills as a really big component, both of what you're learning and what I'm doing in the workshop as the, the facilitator. Uh, I also taught Overcoming Imposter Syndrome, which talks a lot about um, dynamics, uh, the effects of systemic oppression on how people participate in meetings and the effects that have, has on their own self-image and the way they perceive themselves, what they aim for, right? So I think that's an important part of meeting skills is saying, what are the systemic problems? How do they affect individuals? How can we make a, a difference? Um, and I think this is really important. Uh, I worked for a bunch of very large corporations, uh, IBM, uh, 400,000 people at the time, Intel, Sun, Red Hat, and a bunch of smaller organizations where there are a lot of meetings and actually a bunch of people who know how to have good meetings. Uh, and I've served on two boards of directors. That's a high stakes meeting with seven, <laughs> seven people from 18 time zones and uh, you really wanna make the most out of your hour and a half, so. All right, uh, so this is how, this is what we're gonna spend the class time on. I have never uh, actually taught this class before. I'm hoping to end before the end of the hour with enough time for questions. Uh, if we can't do questions and answers uh, live, um, feel free to email me um, at my Frameshift Consulting address uh, on the meeting invite. So. Uh, but we'll start out with an introduction, try to get some motivation for learning this. Uh, we'll talk about general meeting hygiene just so we get that out of the way, so you're not sitting there thinking like, shouldn't we have an agenda? Right, uh, and then we'll talk specifically about roles that make for good meetings, and that'll be the majority of what we spend our time on. Uh, then we'll uh, do some a, a few more uh, uh, trouble spots for discussions, uh, guidelines, and ground rules, tough things, and then we'll end with the questions and answers right after I've brought up the really hard things. Right? So. Okay. So um, uh, I'm not sure how class participationy people are feeling, but. Does anyone have an example of something that happens in bad meetings? Don't worry, I've got a list. Uh, I'll put the mic. Or can we pass the, pass the mic around? How many mics do we have? Yeah. Okay, great. There will be mics for everyone. <laughs> one, of, one, of the, uh, one of the things speaker training will teach you if you ever take it, which I haven't, uh, <laughs> is that you should modify the room as necessary to, to uh, have the great 
presentation you want. So, all right, meeting pet peeves, bad meetings. Yes. Thank you. That uh, um, a large portion of the attendees don't know why the meeting is happening. <laughs> that's uh, that's a really good one. Uh, yes. Anyone? Yes, we've got one there. Fantastic. A lot of people are on their laptops doing something else. Yeah. So an interesting thing about people being on their laptops is that um, that's a sign of a bad meeting, <laughs> not the cause. Yeah. Um, I'm actually guilty of that probably, but tangents in the meeting that just mm -hmm. go on and on have nothing to right. do with the actual topic. Off, off topic off discussions topic. that don't end on time. Yeah. Uh, this group, this person. Yeah. yeah. Um, one or two people do all the talking and nobody else yes. gets to talk. That's a, a major failure of a meeting. You, did you come to a presentation or did you come to a meeting? Yeah. All right. That's really good. Those, those covers a, a lot of the, the, the areas. Um, so here's my list. Uh, some people talk too long. Some people can't get a word in edgewise. Uh, decisions don't get made or decisions are made, but they're made without buy-in from uh, the people who need to give their buy-in. Um, there's a lot of off-topic discussion. Uh, rudeness and humiliation happen a lot, um, and it, it, the, the meeting runs over time, right? Uh, those are some of the characteristics I see. So good meetings look more like this. Um, everyone gets to contribute if it's relevant, right? Uh, decisions are made and um, with the correct buy-in. Most of the discussion is on topic. It's cool to have a little icebreaker, a little tan small, short tangents, but just long enough to figure out you don't need to talk about it. Um, politeness and respect are what you expect to happen. Uh, and the meeting ends on time or early, which is a trick I learned <laughs> from Edward Tufty. Nobody's ever upset to get an extra 15 minutes in their day. So uh, we'll aim for that too. Um, yeah, so the interesting thing I have found about uh, good meetings is that if there's just one person in there who has the skills to, to run a good meeting, often they can make the difference just by themselves. Because a lot of the, the techniques that happen with good meetings, people make sense to people and they want to do them if somebody suggests it, right? Uh, so this, uh, hopefully you're not the, the lone person wanting an effective meeting in your meetings, but even if you are, you can often still make a difference. So we'll talk more about uh, how to do that and also how to do it when you have organizational buy-in. All right, uh, so I just wanna, this is the motivation part <laughs> still. There's other places that you can use good meeting skills. Obviously, unconference sessions are a great place for them. Uh, uh, and that's very much unorganized. A bunch of people just show up. There's no obvious power structure. There's not a long-running long system where so-and-so sends out the agenda. So it's a really good place to, to practice just starting doing meeting skills. Um, uh, talking with friends, actually. Once you've learned this stuff, you'll be like, perhaps I could make sure my friend who never gets to speak gets a chance to speak and stop the person who's telling the boring story, right? These are things you can do. Uh, it works with um, when you're talking to your friends or family, uh, people that you're close to and you're having a, a, an important discussion about, maybe I should send them a list of things I wanna talk about in advance and then we can have a better discussion on the day of, right? Um, and then any kind of hobby where you're working with other people, uh, volunteer work, that sort of thing. Good meeting skills are extremely important because <laughs> a lot of people feel less pressed for time when they're doing these things, so. Okay. So now we're going to go into the, the basics of, of good meetings that are more generic, just so we have them in our head and we're not, they're not sitting there thinking, uh, oh, I should probably mention that. Um, so this is a better, <laughs> this is a good thing to do. Create an agenda and send it out in advance, if at all possible, right? This is hard to do. It takes discipline, but it makes your meeting far better. Uh, it makes a very large difference. Um, otherwise, you don't necessarily have to have a written agenda sent, it, sent in advance if people know what the purpose of the meeting is and are working together towards the goal. Basically, this is getting everyone on the same page, so you're working towards a common goal. Um, I was <laughs> telling someone in the audience before we started, I once had a useless staff meeting at a, one of the large companies I worked at, and I made a deal with my boss who ran the staff meeting that I would go to the meeting if she sent out an agenda in advance. Uh, and in two and a half years, she never sent out an agenda in advance. I never went to the meeting, and it never affected my job. So, <laughs> other than having an hour to write code more every week. So, uh, uh, in, the in the meeting, you'll come up with things that people need to do. It's important to assign them to specific people. Uh, it can't be like, somebody needs to set up the chairs. Like, uh, 
Ashley is in charge of setting up the chairs. That's actually part of a good meeting. Uh, and then uh, action items have to be called out separately in the meeting notes. You're taking meeting notes, right? We'll talk more about that. Uh, but So it's easy to find the things that you're supposed to do and check up on later. Uh, you need to send out the meeting notes to the people who participated within about 24 hours. That's a good guideline. Uh, sometimes you need to do a little editing, find out the name of that person, get a link, something like that. But uh, some meeting notes are better than no meeting notes. Uh, and then have the, some sort of ex explicit system for following up on the action items afterwards. Somebody's responsible for going around and checking to see that they did it. Okay, so it's very, very basic meeting stuff. Um, I wanted, to, I'm glad someone brought this up uh, in the uh, beginning. I want to make a, a quick note about laptops and phones. People often view it's like the problem is that people are on their laptops. I'm totally cool with you being on your laptops because you're actually paying attention. Why? Because there's content and it's relevant. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, rather than viewing laptops as the problem, view it as a signal that, as a, as a sign that there's something going wrong with your meeting. People don't know why they're there. Yes, Ro. Uh, do you want to? Can I get a can I get a um, mic, please? Thanks. Hi, remotees. Uh, I feel like the first bullet point of your slide might be missing a negation in the sentence somewhere. Uh, yes, you're correct. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, might be missing a what? You know, it might be missing like a negating word somewhere, like in a well-run oh, no. meeting, people will. In a well-run meeting, people will be too engaged. Oh, to too use. engaged too. Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah. Yes. I don't mind I you emphasizing you. that point. <laughs> uh, other than the note taker, of course, he's still doing it. So, um, I do want to say though, if you have a long-running meeting that's been terrible historically, uh, and you introduce good meeting skills and it becomes more interesting, you might want to just have one meeting where you explicitly ask people to stop using their laptop because they've scheduled that time for doing their email and they're not even noticing that good stuff is happening right. Um, uh, that's one thing to do, but don't view the laptops as the enemy. View them as the signal or as the sign. The symptom, that's the word you want, S words. Okay, uh, we're gonna go into meeting roles, but I just want to give a quick time for a question. Okay, that's cool. There will be more questions later. Um, so these are the four, uh, the four major roles. I'm going to go into each of them in more detail uh, in the following slides. Uh, moderator, gatekeeper, scribe, and timekeeper. Um, you can read a lot more about these online at this blog post from the Ada Initiative about uh, 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 session role cards, which explain each of these roles in more detail. I also want to give credit to uh, the best corporate training class I ever took at Intel about uh, where I learned about these roles. Um, that's apparently the genesis. A lot of other, there's a lot of other meeting skills stuff out there, and it's things like seven great roles, including, I don't know, like coffee maker. And <laughs> these are the most useful ones I found. So the way I'm going to go through these roles is I'm going to first, I'm going to present. Um, specific bad meeting scenarios, and then I'll talk about how uh, a particular role can help prevent those things. So, Okay, so here are bad meeting scenarios, which hopefully are familiar to you. <laughs> uh, everyone spends half the meeting talking about important but off-topic subjects. Um, Ashley and Lee spend 10 minutes arguing when they actually agree. Uh, there's no significance to the names, they're just supposed to be gender neutral, like to make it a little more concrete. Uh, I, that's the worst. You're like, you will agree if I could just explain to you why you agree. It would be great. Uh, no one can agree on any decisions because there's bad communication. Um, Ashley decides on a new timeline without giving Leslie a chance to share the supply problems. And then later on, this turns into a big fight and there are problems. Or something like Lee snubs Ashley several times in, in the meeting in an obvious way, right? Um, so these are the kind of problems in a meeting that a good moderator uh, can solve. So um, the, this, this person's job is to keep the discussion on topic. Uh, so that means some interrupting when people are going off topic. Uh, they keep us moving along the agenda. Uh, we're trying to accomplish these particular things or says like, hey, we'll be talking about that following on uh, later on. You can also edit the agenda in the meeting as things come up and you discover you're missing things. It's, it's not a set in stone. Um, but you're trying to have some sort of uh, path that's set out. Um, the moderator helps the group make decisions by uh, uh, calling out points of agreement or asking for input on particular areas, uh, which is the seeking out comment part. Um, the moderator, it is the moderator's job to step in when people are being rude to each other um, or dismissive or not treating each other with respect. 
Um, and that's really tough, but it's an important thing to do. Uh, and it's also their job to actually end the meeting. Um, so this person is like the, your guide along the path of a good meeting, down, going down the agenda, uh, trying to keep everyone working together towards the common goal. All right, uh, and we'll talk about implementing these, how to implement these roles afterwards. This isn't like fling it out into the ether and expect you to do it. So um, here's another set of bad meeting scenarios. Uh, Leslie starts speaking and everyone immediately rolls their eyes and checks their laptops because they know it's gonna be a long off topic rant, right? Uh, or Ashley has an important data, but is somewhat shy and every time they start speaking, another person interrupts them. because so you've got like really strong interrupt culture going on. Uh, Lee has good points and is on topic, but they're d dominating this discussion completely. It's like, great, you know what you're talking about, it's on topic, it's not boring, but nobody else is getting a, a chance to say anything. And that's still a problem, right? Uh, that's more the presentation style. So this is where the gatekeeper comes in, and I think many people find this like the most refreshing and eye-opening part of meeting roles. Uh, the concept is the gatekeeper's job is to make sure everyone has a chance to get heard. Uh, so they interrupt people who are speaking too long. Uh, this is a difficult thing to do. It's, it's very confronting for a lot of people. Uh, I want to say, though, that most people who speak for a long time are used to being interrupted <laughs> and take it quite well, right? Uh, the exceptions are extremely powerful people who are not used to being interrupted. For example, any billionaire tech CEO, probably you don't want to interrupt. They won't take it well. Um, that's, a, that's an advanced class. Uh, <laughs> it is possible to interrupt them and make them feel good about it, but you really don't need to learn that. Okay, uh, they also pay attention to people who are trying to speak and not getting a chance, but also people who don't even look like they were trying to speak. A lot of people have given up on being heard in meetings. They're just sitting there quietly. Uh, and when I started learning about gatekeeping and started asking the person sitting quietly, making no motions or moving, not even moving, right? They often have a brilliant thing to say. They've been thinking instead of waiting for a chance to say the thing that they're planning to say. Uh, so this is really rewarding to when you start asking people to participate explicitly. Uh, gatekeeping may not be just inside the meeting. You may need to do some work outside of the meeting. If there's a recurring meeting and you have someone who, who frequently goes on long off-topic rants, uh, often you could work with them outside the meeting. Uh, I've seen the most common suggestion I've seen is give them a chance to do their off-topic rant to you privately. I still think that's a waste of time. I think there are better solutions. <laughs> uh, but also working with people to find out why they're hesitant to, to speak up. Um, they may have ideas about proper turn-taking and you can explain to them, ah, we just do turn-taking differently, or you can come up with a different turn-taking system. I and mean, we'll talk more about turn-taking systems later on. So. Right. Um, next bad meeting scenarios, I like these. Uh, everyone disagrees on what performance targets they set in the meeting. Uh, when I started having, I, uh, uh, for the aid initiative, I had a lot of conference calls uh, across the Pacific with people with different accents that I didn't understand well. And uh, that led to a lot of disagreements about what we actually said in the meeting. Uh, that was really fun. Um, <laughs> I'm glad technology is getting better. Uh, Ashley keeps taking credit for Lee's ideas. Um, perhaps everyone's giving them to Ashley. Perhaps Ashley isn't listening. Perhaps Ashley is outright stealing them. It's still happening. Uh, no one can remember what the sales figures were from last week that we presented earlier in the meeting, right? Uh, and Leslie finally got everyone to agree to a diff difficult decision, but the next day, Ashley doesn't remember it the same way and claims that we agreed something else entirely, right? So these are all terrible problems. Um, and this is what a scribe is for. Uh, it's also called note taker or record keeper. There's a bunch of different names. I like scribe. It's a good like Anglo-Saxony word. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, they take note of major contributions and decisions in the meeting. So not everything, uh, but some things. Uh, what I really like is doing collaborative note taking with on online uh, document sharing. That's fabulous because then when the note taker is talking, someone else can take notes for them. Um, they, an important job of the scribe is to interrupt when they're not sure about something. Uh, and this is really helpful to clarify for the rest of the meeting as well. If the scribe isn't sure, probably someone else wasn't sure either. So uh, they record the action items. It's crucial to an effective meeting. Um, and then they send the notes out. So and these are all things that help with all those four problems we talked about. All right, last, last scenarios and roles, and then we'll go into more uh, implementing it and hard stuff. Uh, so the <laughs> this one has happened to me more times than I can count. 
The last three agenda items don't get discussed in the meeting for lack of time, and they are the most important items. That's why you put them last, <laughs> because otherwise you weren't going to get to talk about anything else, right? Uh, if this happens four times in a row, you're in real trouble. Uh, the, or the meeting goes way over time, and Lee is late to pick up their kids. Uh, or discussion on an important topic is rushed because you don't have enough time and important information gets left out, right? Uh, so this, this is what the timekeeper can solve. Um, this person's job is to uh, see if we're going to keep track of the progress in the meeting to see if we're going to end the meeting on time. Um, in a fantastic, perfect agenda, your agenda will note how long each discussion is expected to take. Most of the time, the timekeeper is going to have to make them, that up on the fly and figure out, like, mm, probably it's going to take half an hour to talk about this, so we better get there soon. Um, so the, the timekeeper's job isn't to end the meeting, that's the moderator's job, but the timekeeper is there to remind people of how far away the end of the meeting is. Um, and that involves interrupting often. So you'll notice that interrupting is a, a key skill in this <laughs> in good meetings, <laughs> but the right kind of interrupting. So, all right. Uh, so here's how you put these roles into practice. Um, you can, once, uh, if you can get everyone else to agree about this, uh, you can start explicitly assigning the roles at the beginning of your meetings, if it just becomes a, a cultural thing. Uh, one of the, um, the things we do for the unconference, we'll talk more in, de in more detail, is we printed out the role cards. There's a physical reminder that you need to assign roles to people. It's easy, and it's a good thing to do if you're trying to start this as a, a practice in your organization. Um, so an important thing to remember is to avoid uh, assigning women the role of scribe more often than you do men proportionally. Uh, look for other power imbalances or power relationships and try to avoid uh, assigning the job of scribe on the basis of that. An interesting thing about the job of scribe is it's actually extremely powerful uh, because this is the person who uh, records who gets credit for things. So um, it... I encourage you to think of it as a position that um, uh, more senior people should take on. You don't have to have four people to have a good meeting. Um, more than <laughs> one person can take on more than one role. Uh, it's, it's good to have them split out, uh, especially timekeeper is extremely hard to do uh, if you're doing the other roles in the meeting. Uh, or taking notes, it's hard to moderate at the same time you're taking notes. Uh, but at least attempting to do it and being aware that the roles are there is better um, than uh, nothing at all. Uh, often I think a gatekeeper and moderator can be done in, in concert, but that really means the gatekeeper and moderator needs to be not speaking very much. So, um, so uh, related to this, if, if a particular person um, who has a role is speaking or distracted or otherwise just not doing a good job, uh, it's reasonable to fill in. Uh, the thing I want to, so just because someone's been assigned the role of gatekeeper, doesn't mean that you can't also jump in and say, hey, I think we're getting off topic. I think we need to let so-and-so speak. You can still do that. Um, keep in mind the downside of, the, of doing that is if you're approaching this meeting with disrespect for the skills of other people, uh, you can definitely come across um, as, uh, as disrespecting them because you are not respecting them. The other uh, uh, scenario in which this is dangerous is if people view this as um, some sort of power play you're just trying to get a good meeting to run running, but they're interpreting it as you challenging their dominance, right? And that's that's another thing to be wary of. However, in general, most meetings with goodwill, uh, if you're if you jump in and remind people of the time uh, because the timekeeper has clearly gotten distracted, most people will appreciate it. Uh, in general, power relationships do make this harder, and we'll talk specifically about that just before the Q and A part, which is, I think, good timing. So. Okay, so that, that's about when um, you are working together with a shared goal of having better meetings and awareness about this. Um, so I've actually found you can use these skills in meetings that you're not in charge of, that you're just showing up randomly, you don't know the other people very well, you maybe don't have a reputation in this group, right? Um, it's amazing how often people are grateful when someone starts taking on these roles in a meeting. Like if the meeting's just not going anywhere and you suddenly start like keeping people on the agenda, Everyone will just feel better, and they won't know why. <laughs> so I know it's, it's scary to, to take on a role of, of what feels like power and influence without um, explicit permission. Uh, but consider that most people will be happier, including you, if you, if you are willing to do this. Um, 
you can also suggest that other people take on roles. People usually take this really well, like, hey, does someone want to take notes? And like, oh, I heard that taking notes is a good thing to do in a meeting, and I would love to read them afterwards. And uh, uh, it's actually better to ask a specific person because um, people with less power are more likely to volunteer for what are, are viewed as lower status jobs. So keep that in mind. But in general, like asking, suggesting that people take on the roles will often get good volunteers. Um, and again, power people who are viewing this as a power play is going to be a problem. Um, uh, so be aware, be aware of that. Sometimes people <laughs> want you to show up and be bored for an hour as an expression of dominance. What can I say? Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about uh, specifically on conference sessions how this works out. Um, so I read a whole lot of survey results uh, for Ada camps, and I found that there was this universal constant across what people viewed as good sessions, but good on conference sessions, and having a good moderator was key. Um, is there a mic? There we go. Yeah, I just want to make sure the people listening online can. I don't know what an unconference is. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, yes, uh, that's the danger of, of being in this. So uh, an, an unconference is similar to a conference, but um, the programming is decided on the day of the conference by people making suggestions like, I would like to talk about Beanie Babies. And a bunch of other people say, I would like to talk about Beanie Babies too. Uh, and then there's a you, you set a time and a place for it, and then you, a whole bunch of people show up and talk about Beanie Babies. Uh, you can see that there's very little structure, there's no one in charge, there's not a presentation. Uh, and so self-organizing that session really depends on whether people in the, in the session have any meeting skills, right? So uh, any other questions about unconference? Okay, cool, this is a really good point. Um, uh, so the, the upside of an unconference is that you're talking about, you know that you're talking about things that people are interested in. So that's a first good start to having a good meeting. Like people voluntarily showed up because they wanted to talk about this topic, hooray. Um, yeah, so, so in and on conference, the good sessions all had good moderators, like someone who guided the discussion. Uh, they also um, uh, uh, have good note takers and good timekeepers and um, uh, good gatekeepers, but having a good moderator was really key. Uh, so we printed out these roll cards and put, one in e uh, put a set of them in each room to remind people to spend some time assigning roles at the beginning of the session. Uh, and I've definitely seen sessions go um, where people forgot they were supposed to be doing a particular role, uh, especially in this sort of situation where it's very informal. Uh, and that's when it's really good for you to, to pop up and start uh, participating as that role. Um, so yeah, this, these are, uh, if you, you'll have a physical reminder in the on conference to do this stuff. And I just wanna give you permission to step up anyway, even if someone's not uh, doing the job that they, they took on. All right. Um, so we wanted to add an additional suggested role for unconference sessions for the upcoming unconference. And this is the role of reporter. Uh, so we're gonna have an opportunity at the end of the day um, to turn the results of each session uh, into a 90 second lightning talk. I'm pretty sure it'll be 90 seconds. That might vary a little bit. Uh, you don't have to do this, but if you feel like what you talked about is something you want to let, re let the rest of the organization know, this is your chance to share it. Uh, and so having a person agreeing before you leave the session that someone will do this uh, is part of the plan. And we'll have a printed card for that as well to remind you. Um, you'll have, need to sign up in advance to give one of these talks, and it'll be at the end of the day. And you'll also be the contact person, uh, if not the leader, for following up on that session. So we're trying to get the most out of this day. All right. Okay, um, so we'll go into a couple more details and then um, please have questions ready. After I think we've got three more slides. Uh, excellent, great, this is exactly the timing I wanted to be on. Um, so turn taking is hard. Turn taking is how, how does someone get the floor to begin speaking, right? Um, and uh, when you've got a group with a bunch of shared social norms and similar uh, levels of socialization around interrupting or speaking how long they should speak, um, you can do it with, it with something as simple as eye contact, right? And there's a bunch of other things, restrictions you have to have for that to work. You have to be in person, um, everyone needs to be sighted, um, everyone needs to be, uh, uh, if not neurotypical, able to look people in the eyes without problems. Um, so there's a bunch of reasons why this is this sort of default subconscious level of deciding who speaks next uh, doesn't work. Uh, in particular, when people have different thresholds around interrupting, um, 
and in particular amount of time you wait after someone has spoken before you start speaking. That varies a lot. What do you call it? Collision back off time? Something like that. Uh, <laughs> So um, I'd like to ask you to consider using explicit signals for the unconference. Um, uh, it's gonna depend on the size of the session and, and you can agree on them at the beginning of the, the session uh, if you'd like to use them. Uh, so there's a bunch of ways for saying, I want to talk and then um, going through it. Um, the easy one is raise your hand, right? We, most of us learn that at some point in our lives. Uh, or you can raise a finger so it feels it's less tiring and it feels less you know, <laughs> childish. Uh, another uh, technique people can use is uh, have uh, somebody whose job is to write down who wants to speak uh, in a list, and then you go through the list in order. Um, one of the signals I really like is, um, because this happens to me all the time in a meeting, I have something to say that's relevant to the discussion right now, not when we get to me in 10 minutes, but it's short, right? Uh, and so you can have the signal of two hands means I have something that's relevant right now and short, and you won't regret it if you let me speak. Right. So. <laughs> um, I want to talk about power relationships explicitly. Uh, so what happens when um, a powerful people are not following the rules, right? Uh, if, there's, uh, if they're not letting the, the uh, gatekeeper gatekeep, or if people are concerned about um, interrupting someone who could harm them um, if they do so. So this is my explicit permission to you to not do your job if it means losing your job <laughs> or otherwise harming you. Hmm. But for people who, who are interested in having good meetings and who have uh, a lot of power in relation to the people in the rest of the meeting, um, I wanted to ask you to be aware of that power that you have and that you need to be more aware of it and you need to do a better job of regulating yourself, right? Um, if, if it's going to cost people more to interrupt you to tell you you're talking too long, you should, it's your job to um, uh, pay more attention to whether you're talking too long and stop yourself. Uh, another way to uh, deal with powerful people um, and uh, having bad meeting hygiene is to discuss it outside of the meeting or find someone who, who is in a position where they can discuss it with them and have them do it, so. That's the, the basic approaches to what if there's someone that I don't feel comfortable moderating or gatekeeping. So. Okay, so um, this, is, this is a super bad sign if you're having humiliation, domination, or insults happening in your meeting. Uh, I learned how to do all of these things uh, because that was the corporate culture I was in at various points. Uh, also, I worked in the Linux kernel. <laughs> you may have seen some news stories about um, humiliation, domination, and insults in the Linux kernel. Uh, so don't blame yourself if you needed to do this to get your job done. Um, uh, but yeah, this is usually reflecting a systemic problem. Um, this is something you should strive to not have in your meeting. And if you are in charge of this, this meeting and you have power over it, it's something that you can enforce. Uh, so this is a job for the moderator, for sure. I just want to talk about some of the, the types that are more subtle, because there's the outright, you know, your idea is stupid, um, or you're an idiot, and that's more that's easier to recognize. Uh, but there's more subtle things like, uh, well, actually, is where you're saying, well, actually, and you give this, like, you're, you're supposed to be, you pretend that you're giving someone information or correcting a, a mistake, but actually what you're doing is showing dominance and your uh, greater knowledge, right? Uh, passive aggressiveness is a, is a tough one. I recommend reading a book on that if, you're, if it's hard to recognize. But basically, if someone says something and you're like, well, that seems nice, but I feel bad, it's probably passive aggressive. <laughs> Pay attention to your feelings there. There's a bunch of nonverbal ways um, to be insulting in, in a meeting. Um, um, expressions, sneering, um, uh, not paying attention, uh, or ostentatiously not paying attention is an interesting uh, technique. That's also not okay. Um, I, again, I wouldn't put using your laptop necessarily in that category. If somebody sighs loudly and then types very loudly, then yes, that would be ostentatious. Most of the time, though, someone using their laptop just means that your meeting is, is not particularly high in information content. Um, so you can handle this, these things in the meeting if, if you're like up on your skills and it's a good situation, or you can try to deal with it after or um, before the meeting as well. So it doesn't have to be in the moment. It's nice when you can fix things in the moment. Sometimes you have to do things in the moment, but uh, uh, 
yeah, this is sometimes you can't. And again, don't beat yourself up too badly if you can't stop this because often it's reflective of what's happening outside. The good case is when you actually have a decent system and you just got someone coming in who's been trained in a bad system, like I was. Uh, and you just need to be like, hey, that's not how we do things here. Actually, the way that we express um, competence and power is by being nice and showing how helpful we are, right? Oh, I get it now. Okay, so that's the, the part where I talk up here. Um, uh, I would love to answer questions either live right now um, or uh, uh, on, online. Unfortunately, I need to leave pretty soon after this event. So, um, yes, we can do a line at the mic or we can pass around mics, however you prefer to do it. Hello. Thank you all for your attention. It was great. So um, my question was about, I, thank you very much. This is great. I love how clearly we've laid out everything. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Just trying to get out of the... Yeah. Thank you. Um, so here we have many, many meetings with people all over the world, and much of our meetings mm -hmm. have one or two uh, people who are remote. Sometimes they're all remote people. So do you have a specific um, uh, insight that you can give us to, um, oh, give us to uh, help the effectiveness of meetings that... Uh, support uh, people who are remote as well as in, in, uh, in the room with us? That's a great question. Um, I once had, a, <laughs> allow me to humble brag, uh, I once had a, a recurring weekly video meeting in like the early 2000s and we had a graduate student who was researching video meeting interaction and he actually told us that we were the best users of video meetings he'd ever seen in like 2003, right? So <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, I, what I like about, um, remote participation is that it brings out a lot of these things that are often hidden cultural problems that disadvantage people that are not obvious, right? Uh, and makes them really explicit. So um, my particular technique for video meetings is that um, the, the gatekeeper and or the moderator does an explicit verbal check-in like every five to 10 minutes uh, with the people who are um, remote to say, hey, uh, I, does anyone on remote have something they want to say, or does that make sense to the rest of you, right? Because you can't see they're, that they're looking confused or they're not paying attention or they look unhappy. Yeah, go ahead and follow up, yeah. You were gonna say, you were gonna say something more? Go ahead. Okay, the, the follow-up would be, you talk about the taking turns. I can't remember what you called it, but that is really hard online sometimes. Like I'm interviewing people online for design research all the time, and I've kind of, figured out a way to watch and kind of wait because everyone is so different. Like you said, there's a different period of time of hesitation before, all right, it's your turn. And do you have any insights for us about that? Because there's sometimes a technical, like a delay right. in the delivery of the person's face. <laughs> yes, so um, uh, I participated in a weekly conference call with someone across the Pacific for five years. Uh, and we made the rule that the person who is the farthest away in terms of network lag time um, always wins collisions, right? So, and, and there's gonna be a specific rule that's gonna work for each of you, um, but try to be creative with that sort of thing. Because yeah, she she would wait the you know 300 milliseconds or whatever it is and not hear anything because nobody's voice was getting to her. So we just made that rule and it worked because she didn't dominate the conversation, so. Um, sure. Hi, can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Uh, I had a question about uh, the issue of inattenti inattentiveness or multitasking in the meeting. Uh, it seems to me that there are sometimes legitimate reasons why someone might be uh, bored or uh, feel their attention is more deserving, more deserved elsewhere, and that might uh, be because you've heard this story from your close friend slash manager, you know, eight times, or uh, you're a non-technical person and this part of the meeting is, is dealing with technical subjects that might as well be in another language for you. So I'm wondering, like, it seems there's a tension sometimes between those things, and I'm curious if we could like have more nuanced. Understanding. Yeah. So, so not everyone. This is a good point. I agree, um, and that's why I don't like to beat up people for using their laptops in meetings. Um, the uh, uh, you may be doing something relevant to the meeting, or you may be doing something that's more important right then. You may only be able to attend the meeting because you're allowed to be on your laptop because you need to watch some other thing. There's a bunch of different reasons. Um, the, the sign I look for uh, is you really want to be looking at how am I using people's time? And there's no hard and fast rule, but there's a point at which if something, if there's like 
30 minutes of the 60 minute meeting is irrelevant to half the people there, maybe you need to split that meeting up, right? Um, so pay attention to your boredom, what it's for, and do you actually need to be there? Maybe that is a sign that the meeting needs to be reformed, even though it's being run well. Okay, thanks. And uh, just a quick follow up. Sure. Uh, have there ever been times when you felt it was uh, helpful for a moderator to announce like, okay, we're done with this part of the kind of an alert to the folks who are on their laptops that the subject has changed or anything like that? Yeah, so you notice, uh, for example, in this presentation, I give a lot of like um, signposts, like what I'm going to do in the next three slides is blah. After this thing I do next, we're gonna do that. I think that's very helpful, yes. All right, hi. Um, I have a, there's a little trick that I learned uh, to help with remote people in meetings. Um, when there's like two people who are remote and then a, a group of like five or six in the room and what they can see basically is just like from the one camera, it is really, really hard for them to connect because there's a lot of information that happens in the room that's nonverbal. Um, there's a lot of stuff with your face and, and with kind of the way that you're carrying yourself. So something that I learned to do is if there's you know five people in the room that each of those people is also on camera like they just set up they join the hangout um you know they turn off the mic obviously um you know you're still using the room mic and then the remote people also get to uh to have that information i think it kind of helps that's, them that's to, a good idea the close-ups like, the close -ups on the face so yep. that the remote people can also see your face and that part, part, another thing i try to do is i try to pay attention to uh, like I was in a meeting recently where it was clear from our body language that in the room we had agreement. Mm -hmm. um, so I checked verbally for agreement in the room and then I checked verbally for agreement on remote. Um, so a lot of times it's translating things that are happening non-verbally into something that can trans, uh, transmit. But I like that idea. Yeah, thanks. Hi, can I ask a question oh, from yes, uh, Blue Jean? Yes. Um, I was actually trying to figure out how I could ask this question, um, since there wasn't a clear way for remotees to ask them. Um, so maybe I was told this was standard. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Okay. Well, what can a facilitator do when things come up in a meeting where someone uses passive aggressive things like, well, actually, or even aggressive aggressive statements? Like, what are good <laughs> phrases to turn that around and rebalance power? Yeah, um, so a lot of times I'll say something that that is, uh, you know, that seems a little off topic or trying to refocus on um, on the subject at hand. Uh, this isn't it just it's not an it's not an easy solution. And um, frankly, it just took a lot of running, a lot of running meetings, a lot of running workshops um, uh, before I had a good sense of it. Um, one of the techniques I use is uh, praising people for behaving well before they have begun behaving well. <laughs> you know, thank you for showing us how to take this thing offline. Like taking something offline is a great way to do things. Um, uh, but oftentimes you also like, there is no positive way to handle something in a meeting. And so I actually highly recommend uh, Captain Awkward, the advice blog for awkward people, which has a lot of scripts um, for how to handle uncomfortable situations. But the most important advice they have is uh, that it's already uncomfortable uh, for people in the room. It's just not uncomfortable for the person who is doing the bad thing, un intentionally or unintentionally, right? And so kind of your job is to turn around that uncomfortableness on the person causing it um, or on the person who has, and what, by I mean ca causing it, I'm talking about the person with the most power who is creating the situation, not the person who is suffering from it uh, who is often viewed as the cause of the problem. You know, if there weren't so many like women in this room, we wouldn't have so much sexual harassment, right? No, that's not how it works. <laughs> uh, so committing to uh, practicing being uncomfortable um, and pursuing thing, doing things even when they make you uncomfortable is a, is a great first step. So I, ho I hope that's helpful. And I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry about the uh, not having explicit instructions about um, remote participation. Hey, no worries, but Captain Awkward, the website, sounds like it'll be really useful. So thank you for that, um, yes. oh, that resource. Note, the captain is a woman. Uh, don't be assuming anything. So, all right. <laughs> uh, I'll take another question from in the room, and then I'll take a question online, uh, from online. Yeah. So I actually have a question about questions. All right. Um, Let's go so, meta. <laughs> so, yes. So I, I experienced this mostly in 
regular conferences, not in unconferences, but I can see how this might happen. And maybe it's either something that we might need to be aware of, or maybe you have a, a like a suggestion of what to do. But um, you mentioned that sometimes, you know, in order for, to take questions, maybe you, uh, someone can take like, you know, the people in order and ask in order. And what I noticed is that a lot of times people with, um, who are shyer or like shy and whatever are last and then you don't hear from them because there's no time. And I think whoever is taking that, you know, list of people need to either be aware of that or whoever is managing also the question and answer because, you know, there's a line to the microphone or there's whatever it is. Um, sometimes you end up with like, you know, the powerful people talking and the shy people who took a little bit to kind of analyze and decide what they want to ask at the end, not having time to ask questions. So. Yeah, okay, so questions and the inherent bias in many structures towards people who speak the most, who have the most power, who have the most confidence. Um, so um, in that particular example for turn taking in meetings, it was more about I have something to say less less about I'm, I'm doing a question, but I can see that same thing happening. Um, I do not recall the exact term uh, uh, what what various Occupy groups did, where they would move people up to the front of the line if they're a member of an oppressed group. So you can reorder the line based on power relationships um, or systemic oppressions. Uh, if I can interrupt, I know the answer to that. Uh, there's a group called an advocate, and that person <clears throat> basically monitors the group. Um, it could be multiple people in, in large meetings, and they they serve to bring those people up to the front um, to do the talking. So they their role is solely to find the people who might be oppressed or shy or whatever the case. Yeah, so that's definitely a thing the gatekeeper can do is, is in whatever system you have is, is try to even out the disadvantage um, that way. Another useful way to do it, which I've, I wrote a blog post on this um, about using index cards for questions. So instead of having forming a line and of course, the most confident people who have thought the least jump to the front of the line. Uh, you have people write down their questions on index cards, and then you have someone sort them according to interest or relevance uh, and hand them to the person to, to answer. Or you can do it yourself as the speaker. But that's another way to take out that bias. Uh, question from online. All right, we've got another question in the room. Uh, do you mind coming to the mic? Oh, great, you've got a mic. I got one. Can you hear me all right? Okay. Sorry, I had notes and they were over here. Uh, I, first, I just want to say thank you to Robert for making our lives easier uh, very quickly. Um, yay, meeting facilitation. Um, <laughs> and I had one thought on the aggressive attendees in a meeting. Um, I think that one thing our team often focuses on when we're in a situation of, to use your term, gatekeeper, uh, we just try to help people feel heard by uh, rephrasing in a respectful way uh, what they're trying to say uh, so that they feel heard um, and that people are actually hearing what they're saying. And then we just thank them for their patience and follow up as needed. Um, my question um, is maybe less about the meetings themselves and more about scheduling meetings. I think frequently um, through a combination of a lack of time and importance of topic, um, there, we don't always get through the things that we want to get through, and there's a resistance to making the meeting longer, particularly if it's a regular meeting. And I wondered if you had experience with that that you could talk to. Uh, yeah, um, uh, just a quick comment on the rephrasing uh, what someone says. Um, there's a bunch of, of different ways to do that. Um, um, rephrasing uh, someone who is trying very hard to be heard and maybe being aggressive about it to make sure that they feel heard, that's a useful thing to do. Uh, there's a way to, re there's a harmful way to do it if you're rephrasing what someone is of less power is saying. Uh, and it, that can of, often be take, seen as, that can turn into taking away their agency uh, in a form of white knighting. Uh, and it's much better to ask everyone to be quiet while, you know, to, or to do some other way to assist them to be heard rather than speaking for them, even if you're rephrasing what they're saying. So yeah, that's a, those are two different ways to use the same tool. Um, uh, on, so you have an, a meeting, a regular scheduling meeting, it regularly goes too long, or, or you regularly can't get through the stuff that's scheduled in it, um, and people don't want to make the meeting longer. Um, uh, you need to uh, do, you need to have another meeting. Uh, often making a meeting longer is not the answer. So maybe that meeting needs to split into two meetings. Um, uh, you may need to increase your moderation uh, of that meeting. Um, or uh, 
uh, you may need to uh, do a better job of cutting out topics in advance or preparing for discussion in advance. So I'd say those are the four major approaches to take to a meeting that repeatedly goes too long. And I just want to note that often the reason a meeting re repeatedly goes too long is that people don't want to talk about the thing at the end of the meeting. Um, and so it just keeps getting pushed off and pushed off and pushed off. And that's a, a difficult thing to notice that can't be easily fixed by technical uh, fixes. Um, so that's a thing. One way to address that is to say out loud in the meeting, hey, it seems like we're all we're dreading speaking about this thing. What can we do to make it easier to get to it next week? Um, and maybe you can at least talk about why you don't want to talk about it. <laughs> all right, any online questions? Okay, great. We have another question in the room. Yes. Shai. Yeah, go for it. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I want to talk a little bit about it's, it's, it's a comment slash question about the role of color in in uh, meeting rules, um, and 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 whether or not all the rules that were discussed today are actually global and could be used everywhere. Um, uh, so I'm not I'm not sure how how much are aware of. Um, uh, our Wikipedia policies, and we have a policy that says uh, assume good faith. So we assume that everyone is talking, uh, they have a good faith, as well as we assume that they're assuming that we assume good faith. So it's a mutual uh, assumption of good faith. Um, so my question here, as we implement those rules that the culture has already has in the meeting, um, so things like Passive aggressiveness could become uh, really an insult, a big insult in some cultures, although it's like a mild thing to have in perhaps corporate culture, as you mentioned it. So uh, I just want to hear a little bit about more about the role of culture in, in meeting rules and, and how uh, we have to adjust them uh, to fit the organization's culture. Great. So um, I am not speaking for the Wikimedia, Wikimedia Foundation when I say this. Uh, I believe assume good faith is an extremely bad rule that harms people. Uh, it should definitely not, I don't recommend it for use in meetings, uh, for sure. I don't actually recommend it anywhere. Um, the thing about assume good faith is that it disarms the people who are working in good faith um, and forces them to put up with a bunch of crap from people who are not working in good faith. Um, you, you can say it's a mutual assumption, but it's only a mutual assumption if you, you're both doing it. So um, uh, I think it's important to take into account various cultures. Uh, one of the things I'm pointing out in this discussion is that there are often cultures which produce bad discussion. I will say the Linux kernel culture is one of those, right? Uh, I've, I've worked at a bunch of different companies. Um, I liked the culture around discussion in Intel much better than I liked it at unnamed other company that was also very large and is now not in business, right? So. Um, uh, Culture is not neutral, uh, but it does affect how you implement these things. And um, when you find it running into, if you find that culture is causing you to have bad, boring, disrespectful meetings where you don't get things done, um, it's time to consider whether you can make a new role in your subculture to overcome the downsides of that. So we definitely have um, uh, many bad things in our larger culture uh, that we are trying to fight in our smaller culture that we have more control over. Uh, but yes, please uh, please um, identify where these things clash and come up with creative solutions, like uh, doing hand raising um, instead of trying to use eye contact for a particular period of time when it's considered okay for someone to speak next. So, um, and, we, um, have, we have we had Samir online also. Right. That was trying. Well, we only have five minutes left, so this is the last question. But thank you. Sorry. Okay. okay. Well, unless it's really uh, quick. So I was wondering. Are we at the Wikimedia Foundation, we have uh, different types of meetings with different no um, numbers of uh, participants. Like we have one to ones, people, um, small meetings for three or four people, and big departments up to 40, and all staff meetings. So, um, and it is notable that when the number goes up, um, the um, uh, people are not always interested on, in everything discussed and more people do other things on their laptops, etc. So if, for example, you have um, a group or a team of like 50 people and you would like to get them together and work, what would you prefer to get them in a monthly uh, team meeting in which everyone participates or like engage them in um, uh, smaller activities or divide them to smaller teams of five to 10 people and get each two of them um, 
working on an activity and then exchange until everyone gets better understanding of what uh, things do. Because, you know, it sometimes makes sense that people need to set with each other and everyone needs to be with everyone. But it makes also sense that you need people to be participating more and having better chance to discuss and work with each other. So what makes more sense and what is better for you especially if there's no time to do both at the same time um, because some people are uh, part-timers working for 15 hours a week, so it doesn't make sense to engage them in 10-hour meetings every week. Right, yeah. Um, so people tend to have a knee-jerk reaction of we need to have a meeting with everyone involved, right? Um, and really it depends on the focus of the meeting. So this is a meeting where I'm doing most of the speaking and it's because I have specific information that you are interested in getting and this is an efficient way to do it, right? Um, Sometimes meetings are just a series of announcements that don't particularly need people's physical participation. Um, usually when you're having a meeting where it's, it's, it's this sort of size of like 20 to 50 people, there's no pretense that everyone's participating. If everyone spoke for one minute in a 50 person meeting, that, that's all that would happen is you would speak for one minute in a 50 person meeting. There would be no greater discussion, right? So I think it's, it's about figuring out what it is you're trying to accomplish. Like perhaps you're trying to accomplish a sense of teamwork. Um, a, perhaps you're trying to give people a chance to speak up if they have a problem in a situation where everyone else can hear them and show their support or, or show um, how they feel about it. Um, so be very clear about what it is you're trying to accomplish and if you can accomplish that in the meeting of that size or if you're just having a meeting because you feel like you should have a meeting. Um, so not, not easy answers. Okay, one last question. <laughs> It's not, oh, hello, is this working? Yes. It's not actually a question. It's oh, sure. an observation um, in response to the fact that no one took on the role for um, IRC relay for this meeting. And so the folks on IRC wanted me to suggest that um, that could be added to the roles when there's a non-voice remote participation like the current YouTube stream that we have because some folks are on blue jeans and some folks are watching on YouTube. So a thought for our organization as we Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I did. I unfortunately have this is my first presentation at Wikimedia Foundation, and I'm not familiar with how you do questions. So, <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, and I think that's a great thing to do is have a, a printout for the person speaking up here to say, "Hey, let's time, let's ask for IRC relay questions." So, uh, yes, we have to end here, but um, don't go to this website. Go to the, the URL in the uh, uh, in the meeting invitation. Also, I'll upload my upload my um, uh, slides uh, at some point when I figure out how to edit the invitation. So uh, thank you very much for coming and I'm uh, looking forward to seeing you at the uh, all hands in uh, January. Thanks.